Welcome back to Behind the Play. My name is Alex Adams, and today I'm very excited to introduce our guest, Harmon Dial, who covers the Canucks for The Athletic, has a great podcast, The Vancast as well, with Farhan Lalji that everyone should check out. Um, thanks so much for, for taking the time and coming on. How's it going? It's going well, well Alex. Thanks for having me on. I, I first want to ask a little bit about your career. When did you first think you might want to pursue a career in, in sports journalism and writing? Yeah, it's really interesting because in my senior year of high school, we had a class called Independent uh, Directed Studies where we essentially got to pick a year-long project related to something we were passionate about. And that would be the one thing we would work on the whole year and it would be uh, it would count as a course. And so for me, I was thinking about things that uh, I'm passionate about, not necessarily even from a career standpoint, but I was like, okay, I love hockey and I figure I'm a decent writer. So I started um, blogging. I mean, earlier when I was 13, 14, 15, I'd done a little bit of blogging, but that was maybe like once every few months. And it was more, more so just because I loved hockey uh, than me. It wasn't a sort of case where I was trying to build a brand or a career or anything, but I started that in my senior year of high school. And from there it, um, it just kind of took off. I realized that I really, really loved writing. I realized that it was a lot of fun to be able to analyze and, and break down hockey. And it was, yeah, that grade 12 year where I realized that I really wanted to turn this into a, a career. And and what did you love so much about writing? Was it, I know you, you involve a lot of analytics. Was it that part? Was it just kind of bringing yourself into your writing and, and finding a voice? What What do you love so much about writing? I just love analyzing hockey, to be totally honest, uh, whether it's with numbers, whether it's with video. I love the process of diving really deep on one player or, or, or one team and then being able to find a new insight and share it with an audience. I just think that's super cool. Uh, I've always been somebody that loves to go super deep on something. And, and that's where, yeah, it started with analytics. Then I, then I really enjoyed video analysis as well mm -hmm. and being able to essentially solve problems, uh, uh, find and learn something new. And then again, just being able to share it with an audience. I think, I think that part was uh, really captivating for me. And I guess how, how do you bring that? Like what's your process specifically in terms of mixing the analytics into the storytelling do you approach it with hey this is the player this is the problem and then work the analytics in or do you might have an idea of the analytics and then figure out the problem how does what's your approach yeah it, it's always a little bit different because sometimes you might be looking at a trend for let's say the canucks last 20 games you might be looking at the underlying numbers and you might go well damn this is really interesting in terms of oh, this, this player's um, uh, shot attempt share has, is really lagging. It, it seems as if they're spending a lot of time in, defending in his own end as opposed to being able to generate positive two-way results. And then you might start trying to dig deeper into, okay, why is that, right? And so sometimes that might just start as, oh, there's something really interesting mm -hmm. in the data. Let's investigate this. Other times it might just be something as simple as, I'm noticing something on the ice, right? Right, And just by watching the games and a classic example that I always bring up is for me growing up, I always realized watching the games that Chris Tanev was an excellent defensive player, but I, I thought it was so interesting that unless you watch the games, you wouldn't know that he's a great player because a, he didn't score a lot of points. B, it's not as if he was logging 25 minutes per game. So he just looked at, looked like some run of the mill defender. If you were, let's say a fan, a hockey fan in Toronto who doesn't yeah. watch the Canucks a lot. And so I thought, okay, like how can I bridge this gap? And that's where I realized that's where in that sort of case, that's an example of a different process where now I'm searching out, okay, is there a way to quantify his defensive impact in a way that others can understand? And so, the, you know, you weave that in with, you know, video clips and examples of, uh, of, you know, sort of relating why a player is driving the res results they are. And that's where I, again, just really enjoyed um, that niche. And the way that I've always approached it is, again, I, wanted, I want a reader to learn something new, learn mm -hmm. something interesting, give them food for thought. And in terms of the analysis, I always view analytics as telling you results and then it's up to you as the analyst to understand how to interpret it because it's not always as cut and dry as 
okay, these numbers aren't great. That means this guy's a bad player. A lot of times you have to search for the video and the eye test, and that tells you why uh, results are happening the way they are and being able to contextualize and merge everything is is what I love to do. And I want to circle back. A, you obviously work for The Athletic. How did you break into journalism sports? Like as a hockey writer at The Athletic, I think you're like, you weren't even 20. Was that correct? Like, how did you, how yeah. did you do that? Yeah. So once I started uh, blogging, I realized that was quickly going to be my ticket in terms of building up a portfolio where I, I could show p future potential employers. This is the work I'm cap capable of. And then honestly, I, I would just send cold, uh, cold emails. Mm. Totally honest. That's, uh, uh, it was a little bit different back in the day where the athletic was uh, was still relatively new and starting up. And so they took freelance pitches. And so I uh, literally just sent a cold email, uh, showed a, showed some examples of the type of work that I did and uh, pitched a very specific example of what I wanted to write and why I thought it would be valuable for the audience. And from there, they gave that first approval. I think that article performed well on the site. Plus I was really fortunate from that point on to be able to connect with uh, Jason Botchford, who's mm -hmm. uh, was obviously an absolute legend in this marketplace. And he was able to take me under his wing, really helped me establish myself here at the athletic. And I was able to take off that year as a freelancer. He helped me a ton in terms of establishing a foothold in the Vancouver market and things just kind of took off from there. Uh, and I kind of want to switch a little bit to the Vancouver market and, and the Canucks and a little bit just about diversity in the sports media itself. And um, you mentioned Jason Botchford, obviously, um, you know, has a great legacy in, in the market. Um, but also, you now do the Vancast with Farhan Lalji. And when I had him on the podcast and he talked a little bit of tongue in cheek and said that if you're white now coming up in the industry, he might feel bad for you a little bit. Um and what has your experience been as a person of color who's a hockey journalist and and how do you feel about the hockey media landscape for people of color maybe even specifically in Vancouver when there's so many people of color in in the in the market yeah it's been really cool to uh to see a lot of strides in that area because i know for me growing up it was pretty much only Farhan that I can think of off the top of my head in, in the Vancouver market in terms of a, a voice that was, um, you know, really prominent. I guess there were, there were others as well outside of Vancouver, like Ian Mendez for mm -hmm. me growing up was, uh, was still huge in Ottawa, but yeah, there weren't a lot of, uh, of people right in the limelight. I honestly never saw it as, um, as a drawback or a disadvantage though, because in Vancouver, fortunately enough, I've never really felt that I've been treated differently because of, uh, because of my skin color or anything. So, uh, in that way, it's honestly, I honestly even haven't really thought about that, like that side of it, but it's been really cool to where I know a couple of times when I've, um, when I've done sports net panels, I, uh, I've had conversations with, uh, with other people, uh, coming up to me and, and saying that, Hey, my kid is, um, you know, is five, six, seven, eight years old or whatever. And, uh, he thought it was really cool to see uh, another uh, another Indian person on the, on the panel, and and just to sort of see that type of possibility that hey, our community is being represented uh, there as well. And obviously, uh, you're seeing a lot of other voices in the marketplace as well shine in that way. So I think it's uh, I think it's great, and and hopefully it can um, you know it can continue to inspire people to realize that the there aren't as many barrier barriers as you may think. And and if you were talking to that six year old or maybe more like a twelve to kind of fifteen year old, uh, someone that's aspiring to be a journalist, what advice would you give to that young person uh, in to make it in the hockey journalism industry? Yeah, I'd say two things. First, I'd say find uh, find a niche, find something that you can be better than everybody else at. Not that you know, there are always going to be people that are better than you at whatever skill you're, you're, you're trying to pursue, but that's, a, that's the approach you should want to take, right? Uh, you should really try and hone in on whether it's, you know, maybe you, you choose prospect coverage and then your goal that you obsess over is I want to be the best prospect analyst possible. Right. And obviously that's, that's, you know, might be an unrealistic goal, right? There are, again, there are so many brilliant people in, in all these specific industries, but once you have that level of ambition and drive, I think that's essential, especially in an area where you feel you can truly differentiate yourself 
for me, I remember at that time when I was just breaking into the Vancouver marketplace, this was around 2017, 2018, 2019, there was a bit of a transition phase where a lot of the amazing Canucks Army writers who had done outstanding work, be- better work than than I've ever done, mm. were starting to get scooped up by NHL teams. They were starting to get hired. And so what that did was it created a, a sort of vacancy, a hole in the market where there wasn't a lot of that type of analytically focused content anymore. Mm. And it just so happened to be something that, that I loved as well. And that helped me distinguish myself, I believe. So that's where finding a niche is uh, is crucial. And then the second side of it is, I would say, make sure that whatever you pursue is something that you're genuinely pas- passionate about and love because it can be a long path. It can be a grueling path. I was really lucky to where I got that break early, but I know of a lot of colleagues who had to toil for, for years, just freelancing, not having that, that first big break. And for them, the reason they were able to stay resilient and persistent through all of it was because it was a labor of love more mm-hmm. than it was. I, I, I want to make a name for myself and, and I, and I want to do this because uh, it'd be really cool to be a journalist. Like it has to be something that deep down you really love and enjoy because it is a, uh, it is a tough industry to break into. And um, inevitably it's at one point or, or another, there will be sort of resistance in trying to take that uh, next step. I, I want to move a little bit from, from what advice you'd give to, to maybe the onus of sports of journalists, for example, especially sports journalists and, and hockey journalists. And, um, in the NHL right now, there's been a lot of, I guess, discourse and and maybe mild protests in terms of how players have treated the Pride Nights and um, with a couple players, starting with Ivan Provorov, not not um, taking part in the Pride Night. Recently, the team you cover, the Vancouver Canucks, Kuz, uh, Andre Kuzmenko didn't. What What is the role of sports journalists when a player makes a stand or makes a statement like that? Um, in terms of how they need to approach players and in these situations and what questions to ask. Yeah, it's not an easy story to cover because a lot of times it's it's different, right? Some sometimes a player will come out and, and like James Reimer did or or the Stahl brothers, they'll be very direct and specific in stating the reason. And I think in situations like that, it's it's easier to sort of communicate why that player made that decision. And others like the Kuzmenko one, it was, it was pretty vague, right? He said it was a family decision. It it doesn't really provide a lot of insight, especially because uh, if you look at some of Michael Russo's work, there are, there are complicating factors for Russian players along those lines. But we don't we don't know. Like, was it uh, family pressure related? Was it just a personal decision in terms of his own beliefs? It, it, it's tough in a situation like that. And for me, what I try would, would try to do is yeah. Tr- you know, shine a spotlight, try, try to do whatever you can to sort of figure out uh, why that player made that decision, but also don't let that night become the, where, where that, the, the sole focus is on the person who didn't participate because I still think the Canucks as an organization did a tremendous job of, um, of putting on that pride night. Uh, You saw the excellent Jersey designs. uh, And I think the organization deserves credit where I, I think you've seen other NHL teams like the Minnesota Wild, for example, who cited, okay, Kaprizov isn't um, isn't going to participate, so we're just not going to do this as a team. Whereas the Canucks, they still went forward with it. Whereas they could have looked at Andre Kuzmenko and gone, okay, he's a core player. He's, um, he's so likable in this market. Do we, you know, the alternative, somebody internally could have been like, let's just not do this as a team. So we shield Kuzmenko and his individual decision. So he doesn't face backlash. But I like the fact that they con- continue to recognize that, okay, this is an important sort of um, initiative for the community. And, f- and from there, I think it's also important to applaud that side of it and focus on that, uh, that element. I want, I want to switch gears a little bit. Um, I really liked your piece for the athletic about looking at the defensive metrics of the best NHL uh, centers or shutdown centers in your mind, how can stats effectively capture defensive impact in a game such as hockey, where it's pretty hard to quantify defense. 
Yeah, it is right. There's no, no doubt about it. There's no perfect way of, um, of objectively measuring defense, especially when you have to account for one player's impact in a game where, where there are at any given time, nine other skaters on the ice and defense is effectively, you're trying to measure something that did not happen because the best defense is prevention. It's preventing goal goals. It's preventing shots. It's preventing scoring chances. So it becomes tricky to sort of isolate and, and assign credit for that. I think the, the best way we can do it is trying to use a combination of, uh, of different tools li like I tried to do where first I started with a, a certain minimum threshold or benchmark to clear in terms of ice time, which I think relates to okay, how much does a coach trust you uh, matchups because it's a, a lot different to be defending against uh, predominantly bottom six competition than it is going up against the likes of McDavid and McKinnon and, and trying to shut shut uh, those types of guys down after that um i think there are really powerful tools like uh the, like the one uh, i cited evolving uh, hockey's rpm model which tr which tries to essentially capture and isolate a player's individual impact on preventing uh, shots and um expected goals against based off of um you know after accounting for the players that the um the players that 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 they share the ice with their opponents zone starts all of these different elements and um and yeah just trying to look at a simple case of okay a, a combination of the other benchmark i used was uh at least being below league average in terms of 5 and 5 goals against rate so it's like when you combine all of those factors you you know you essentially ended up with a pool of players who play a lot of minutes and are trusted by the coaching staff to do that typically play against um, top caliber uh, competition in terms of their matchups who aren't on the ice for a lot of goals against. And based off this, uh, this regression model are uh, have a really strong impact at, uh, at suppressing high danger chances. So that's probably the best way that I thought to, uh, to do it again, there's no perfect way of, uh, of doing it. And in the piece itself, I highlighted examples where I thought, uh, the model wasn't doing the best job of of capturing it uh, it objectively, but at least introduces a starting point for conversation. And after that, you're able to apply your own eye test. You're able to apply your own understanding of context, uh, and 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 from there, you're able to then understand how you want to interpret it. And just for the listeners to know, I think it was Patrice Bergeron was the number one. Yeah. So and checked out. I was like, yeah, and yeah, and he was miles ahead, which I'm like, okay, this is, and that's why I leaned on uh, leaned on that model, right? Is if you sort of lean on a model and you're trying to do a sniff test and it's telling you that, um, uh, As, uh, that I don't know, Mark Patrick Shifley. Kane, yeah, yeah, or Mike Shifley is is um is one of the best defensive forwards in the NHL. You'd probably scratch your head and go, okay, that doesn't seem right. When that model is going, all right, the best defensive center in the game by a long shot is Patrice Bergeron, who holds the NHL record for most Selkie trophy wins all time and is on pace for his 12th consecutive year being nominated for the award. I think you're onto something, especially when you saw some of the, the other names on, yeah. on that list. I, I want to move a little bit to the Canucks, obviously the team you cover and they've had just the most tumultuous season. I can remember from a team, um, even for the Canucks standards, uh, not that they've had very, um, kind of smooth sailing seasons the past years in your opinion with all that happened has this been the most dysfunctional Canucks season that you've ever covered it's definitely been the most dramatic the most storylines I mean right out of the gate for them on that first road trip which I was on to start 0-5 and set it was an NHL record in terms of multi-goal leads that they blew resulting in regulation losses it's like that's a historic start to the season. You had a players only meeting after the second or third game. I think it was the third game of the regular season after the wash the Washington game, I want to say. Uh, beyond that, first uh first game of the season at home ice. Home opener, they get booed after after losing to Buffalo as well. Then you had uh, management coming out and they're criticizing the uh the club's preparation and structure under Bruce Brujo all the lingering drama around his future. Then he's finally let go Tanner Pearson injury situation. And Quinn Hughes essentially coming out and saying that that injury wasn't treated right. And the NHLPA investigation for that, uh, Rachel Dory 
who uh, was fired or was first hired by this administration and then let go in the in the human rights complaint that came in the wake of that. All the drama surrounding Bo Horvat's future and the realization that okay, the Canucks were going to have to move on from the cap from uh, their captain. The the way that J T. Miller started the season and fresh off of uh, a seven year extension and, and a huge financial commitment, um, looking like a shell of of the player that he was uh, last season. Of course, he's bounced back in the second half, especially under Rick Tockett, but that was a major concern. Then you lead into the trade deadline and they go out and um, and make that big splash for Philip Peronik. You continue to have all those uh, trade rumors and speculation around names like JT Miller, Brock Besser, Connor Garland, Luke Shen is dealt at the deadline. Then Rick Tockett comes in and all of a sudden he's, he's trying, to, trying to come in and instill, uh, in, instill these new habits, culture, accountability, that's uh, it's it's been a wild, wild year, and it's funny. I was talking to Elliot Friedman when he um had had come, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, uh, to the Lower Mainland f- to participate uh, as part of the Canucks uh, for Kids uh, telethon night, mm-hmm. and um and we were having a conversation about just how crazy the year has been, and and he and he made a joke that. With his Thirty Two Thoughts podcast, which is um is obviously supposed yeah. to, supposed to be a national product. He's like, yeah, exec, execs have been uh, texting him saying, are we going to have discussions about teams other than Vancouver or, th- or is this basically just becoming a Canucks podcast? So I thought that was uh, pretty funny. And um, yeah, I, I can't remember a year this crazy in, uh, in quite a while. And, and the teams obviously, as you know, hasn't been very good on the ice. Who's been the most to blame for that? Is it the coaching? Is it the players? Is it the management? Where, where do you see the the biggest part of the blame in line. Well, that's the thing. I think it's a multitude of different factors. In the first half of the season, Thatcher Demko obviously had um, uh, had a rough go of it, which, based off of his form last season, nobody expected or anticipated. People mm-hmm. were sort of thinking that he might, in fact, be a dark horse Vesna Trophy candidate for this season. And this roster was essentially built in a way where they needed elite goaltending to be competitive in the playoff race. So right off the bat, that um, that was a significant letdown. But also, you look at the environment in front of Demko in the first half of the season, it was a disaster defensively. The number of crossing passes they were allowing, the penalty kill, which uh, for the second consecutive season has been dead last in the NHL. I, actually, they've been better under talk recently, so I, I don't know if they're still dead last, but it, it's been an absolute nightmare. Uh, you had JT Miller at uh, at center ice, sort of uh, struggling and um, and not living up to expectations. And ultimately, this back end, the biggest difference compared to last season is probably that Oliver Ekman Larson and Tyler Myers' play has fallen off a cliff. Last season, OEL and Myers matched up against the opposition's best players, and they were essentially able to hold their own. They were around break even in terms of shots, scoring chances, goals. When they were on, when uh, when that second pair was on the ice, which was a huge advantage because it meant that all of Quinn Hughes's minutes were essentially a bonus in terms of what he could drive at five on five. Now they've been in a spot where it's Quinn Hughes and then literally everybody else in terms of the blue line. Obviously, Philip Prona coming in, he'll help that uh, effort for next season. But the back end, I think because of OEL and Myers's uh, regression has been in particular a huge, huge concern and explains why they struggle so much on the penalty kill, why they've been so porous uh, defensively. But part of the responsibility also lies on the forwards where the forwards, yeah, they can score a lot of goals, but not enough of them are committed defensively in terms of the habits for back checking, for providing support on the breakout, for managing the puck responsibly enough to where they don't expose uh, the lack of talent uh, on the blue line. So it's been, (laughs) there's no shortage of reasons and explanations for why this, uh, this team fell short of uh, expectations this season. And you mentioned a little bit about how Rick Tockett, they've been a bit better defensively and just, they've been playing better under Rick Tockett. What have your first impressions been of him and what has, what have you seen in the difference in play? Um, in the Canucks since uh, Rick Tockett has taken charge. Yeah, we've made it clear that he's not going to tolerate careless puck management. It is one example of an area where since he's taken over, they've generally been a lot better about that in 
especially off of offensive zone entries, where if there isn't um, if there isn't a high percentage play available, they'll look to make the safer play and the, and they'll look to move north south as opposed to east west, which that cost them a lot. When you look at how much they surrendered off the rush, a lot of those two on ones that they were surrendering started from careless giveaways at the offensive blue line. So first of all, I think they've eliminated a lot of their risk there. The forwards, he he's clearly made a message where it's like, guys, you can't just score score goals. That's that's not your sole responsibility. You've got to help these defensemen out with your back pressure, with with how deep you come into the defensive zone on breakouts, the the level of urgency and trying to win battles along the boards, all of those little details. I've seen much, uh, much much more focus, discipline, and appreciation for, which has then allowed some of these defensemen to have more support, more help, and, and has, has made that deficiency on the back end uh, not um, not not look as, as bad as it, as it may be. It, it hasn't seemed as, as deficient. So yeah, that, that has stood out. And of course, I think Patrick Demko coming back and him playing at a, at a brilliant level again makes a huge difference. I, I don't think you can probably half, if not more of the difference right there is just Demko going from playing below average to back to his elite level, which makes a huge, huge difference in being able to shore up some of the club's uh, defensive results. So uh, I, I think those are some of the areas where the coaching staff um, has seen a difference compared to how the the club looked under Bruce Boudreaux. You had, you had a really interesting piece about Tockett and, and in terms of JT Miller's improved defensive play. And you kind of at the end of the article, you reached the conclusion that he might be in between how bad he was defensively at the beginning to, of the year and, and how he's playing now. What what are the expectations, do you think, for JT Miller overall for next season? And can he be a reliable center in your mind next year? Yeah, it's it's an interesting question because we've since we've seen a lot of volatility since he first was moved there with um with the organization in uh, the middle of the 2021 season the 56 game shortened all canadian division year that season we saw miller regress a lot defensively uh, initially right so you had a situation where his five and five points rate was back closer to a, a second line sort of pace his overall points looked pretty good because it was bolstered by power play production but at five on five uh, his point totals fell off a bit, but then the the biggest difference was that was the first time you saw fans criticizing and realizing that, okay, his puck management can be inconsistent. The defensive effort can sometimes be, um, can sometimes be lacking the bad body language. That's when those elements first started surfacing because Miller's first season in Vancouver in 1920, when he was playing the wing, it was, it, it, it was, um, it was a dream. It was all, it was all positive. There was there were no negatives in the initial transition, and you saw when you looked at the numbers in terms of the five and five goals against rate. His uh, at five and five, he was he had among the the highest um, rate in in that area. His two way numbers plummeted, and so you went okay, like that's that's concerning in terms of his overall ability to stick at center. Last season, of course, he had that uh, that amazing ninety nine point uh, season playing down the middle. Then you're like, okay, he's he's a great center. He might even be an elite elite center he might even be a first line caliber centerman moving forward that was the expectation going into the season and then obviously through the first half of uh the year he was a defensive liability in his own end there's no way of uh of no other way of of looking at it now since talking has taken over then you've gotten back to the other side of of, of the equation where you're going he's been dominant he's <laughs> producing an above a point per game clip and um and his two-way results are among like it's not just the point totals. His two-way results have seen the biggest spike of any Canucks forward since Talkin has taken over. And so you go, okay, what's the real JT Miller at center? Like what what is that? What is that answer? And I think that's where you look at all the uh the volatility and you go, it's probably somewhere in the middle of the extremes, the extreme where in the beginning of the season, he was a liability, and now he's been uh, absolutely dominant. Because I don't think you can just go, oh, new coach, he's dominant. This is what we're going to expect mm -hmm. move, move, moving forward. Because we've seen under three different head coaches, 
that it that um that it can it it can sometimes look like the stock market up and down up and down um and so based off that i'm still pretty confident that he can that he can excel at um at center next season i just don't expect it to be quite to this level because when i look at the level of intensity it's taking miller to to play that responsible style how how much he's have, having to expend in the defensive zone physically because when you watch Miller play, he isn't the sharpest player in terms of his defensive awareness. So it's like he's making the reason he's still able to drive those results is literally by sheer force and effort physically. So it's like, can that last over an 82 game season playing that rigorous, extremely taxing style? Probably not to this dominant level. I'm not talking about the point production necessarily. I'm talking about the the level of two-way results. So moving into next season, my expectation is probably if you can exp- if you can hope for him to continue to be around a point per game centerman, while uh, while at least being competent in terms of, in terms of his two-way results. I'm not talking. Uh, it, I'm not expecting him to be Patrice Bergeron or or even what he's been this season. But if he's at least reliable. Like that's that's I think my baseline for what I'd hope to expect from him next season at at center. And his his teammate Elias Pettersson's had an amazing year, by far the best of his career. What do you think has made him so effective this year compared to past years, and now him nearing almost a hundred points this year? I think it's just been the consistency, where for a full eighty two game season he's been able to maintain this form in his. Rookie season in in 2018-19, he was I think he had like 10 goals in his first 10 games. He he, he shot off like a missile. But then what what you saw was okay his first time playing an 82 game season. He, his body wasn't obviously ready for that like like it is for most Swedish players coming over. Where in Sweden, the schedule is around 50 55 games. The travel demands aren't nearly as demanding, especially for a team based on uh, the West Coast, where uh, you're you're on way more long flights than you would be if you're playing on the East coast. So he had that slow, slow, slower second half. It was still an outstanding rookie season. It blew all expectations out of the water. His second season in Vancouver, the 1920 campaign, we saw more of that consistency and you, and from start to finish, you were like, okay, this is a complete player. He took strides in his two way game, but then in the 56 game campaign, for whatever reason, just, it just looked off. he, lacked that same level of confidence and, and composure that he usually has with, with, with the puck just looked like a shell of himself which I think for a lot of top players they'll run into those types of uh, stretches and then of course at the halfway point he really started to pick up steam and then he had that season ending wrist injury mm-hmm. so then you go into last season you have all these contract negotiations going on, all that outside noise. He misses the start of uh, training camp, which I think was pivotal considering this is a guy who didn't have the best best season the year before and was starting to nurse, uh, was recovering and, and trying to nurse a, a wrist uh, wrist injury. I think starting late really hurt him. And, and that's where the mental impact I think snowballed and you could, you could just see it. He, he didn't, he didn't have um, that same level of, uh, of conviction in, in himself. He, it was just so, so uncharacteristic to see him bobbling pucks while, while carrying it through the neutral zone on elementary plays. When this is a player that we've seen with three defenders draped all over him can look like he has ice in his veins. So, it was a, sh- a shocking sort of experience, but then in the second half, he finally started to to be comfortable again. Bruce, Bruce Boudreaux comes in. It's a fresh start for him and the team, and then he took off. Second half was unreal, and then I think in the summer, he really, reali- he really sort of had this burning desire that I, I really want and need to come out of the gates storming. And that's where from the first game of the season, I think it might have even been his first or second shift in that season opener against, against Edmonton. He intercepts a puck, jam, jams, uh, jams a goal in, and you're like, okay, this guy's going to go off this year. You could even see it in training camp how focused and disciplined he was. That's, I think, been the impressive part is just seeing the maturity, the focus, 
the discipline, the un- the understanding that I'm going to have to take the next step in my consistency to become this 100 point type player. And I think that's why he's been able to, to, to take off. And switching a little bit to the defense, what do you think it has, what do you think Quinn Hughes has done this year and maybe improved a little bit overall um, compared to years past? Yeah, I think last season was actually his big step defensively. I know after his sophomore campaign, he, um, he was ticked off at himself in terms of um, his plus minus, which, um, you know, can, can be a misleading stat, but there were definitely, there was definitely a validity to, he really struggled in his own end. And I think going into last season, it was his primary focus to shore up his defensive game. And you saw a lot of improvement in in his puck management. He wasn't, he wasn't turning uh, uh, many pucks over, which is enormously impressive considering how often he's trying to make elite level uh, plays in his own end as a, as a one man breakout machine in the offensive zone, trying to dance and walk the blue line, make those backdoor passes. So you saw an improved puck management. You saw in his sophomore year, he would get caught at times pinching up the boards at the wrong time. And he'd get tagged and burned for odd man rushes against. Now, it's rare to see him sort of pinching at the wrong time and, and putting himself in, in harm's way um, positionally. So that's allowed him to more or less always be in front, you know, have the plane in front of him as opposed to being able, uh, having to race on the back check and recover that way. So that's helped. And um, I know he, he put a lot of focus into his backward skating and trying to work on that side of it so he could defend the rush better. So, all of these little areas have uh, have added up, and of course, in the last um, couple seasons, when when Bruce Bujo took over, he entrusted Hughes with the uh, with the responsibility of killing penalties on um, on a part time basis as well. So it's been a multitude of of little areas. The biggest the biggest reason why he's been able to take a step step is just because he's wanted to. He's had that level of deep ambition and uh, a chip in his shoulder and understanding that. I hate this label of me as a defensive liability. I want to change this. So that drive, you've seen how it's been able to make an impact. I want to move a little bit to how Canucks fans have been feeling about this whole season and probably their animosity or maybe not animosity is too strong a word, but against the uh, management and, and maybe even ownership. And you outlined that you thought that um, it was best for uh, the team to go into a rebuild. I think most fans do that. I know the Canucks fans in my life felt that, um, but it seems as though they're they're set on 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 retooling. And I know you wrote, or I think you said in the VanCast that unless fans stop going to the games, they're they're going to keep trying to retool. How could the Canucks, with where they are right now, become a successful team and competitive through a retooled rather than a rebuild? In your mind, yeah, this is a path they've chosen, and. So when you look at Pedersen and Hughes, you you can understand okay if they're if they're going down this retool retool path, and they're playing at this elite elite level where they're not just star players, but they're one of the top you know five players at their position. First of all, that's a level where combined with Thatcher Demko, he's also probably going to need to be a top five, six, seven goaltender at his position. Like, like that's the initial assumption for what you're going to uh, need to expect, which uh, is a significant burden on the top guys. But we've seen Pedersen Hughes play at this level. It is, it is fascinating that all three of them haven't necessarily been firing at that elite level all at the same time, which part of it is, look, that's what happens with elite players. Like whether it's injuries, bad form, you know, that just kind of happens sometimes. But for this retool to work, I think that's your strongest sort of argument is, okay, we've got player, three players, cornerstones that can be best at each of their positions. That gives us such an advantage to where for the rest of our roster, we still need quality talent, but we can get away with a little bit, uh, a little bit less perhaps than, uh, than, than some of our um, competition. And so really that starts with, okay, they've, they have Hughes. They've now added Hronik on the right side, who's going to make a huge difference. You've got to continue to be able to add at least one more high-end top four defender. 
got to flesh out the center ice depth in uh, in the wake of Bo Horvat's uh, departure. And really, it's at this point, it's a game of how do we carve out cap flexibility? And if we cannot cap out car- cap flexibility, we've got to uh, be able to find a way to find talent from non-traditional sources, similar to which is an area where they've actually excelled at this management regime. You look at uh, Andre Kuzmenko, who's scored nearly 40 goals for them as a European free agent. You're not going to have that type of uh, impact. Um, you know, that's a, a really, really rare sort of piece piece to find. But whether it's European free, free agent market or, or college free agency where they've been re- really, uh, really active or finding reclamation projects, they're going to need to unearth more diamonds in the rough in terms of defensemen, in terms of center ice bin to flesh out and provide, um, provide cheap uh, uh, value because for the Canucks to fit a quality roster under the cap, they can't necessarily go out and just spend a lot of cap and, uh, and, and use money to acquire that talent. They're going to have to find creative avenues. So I, I think that that is the route that they are essentially trying to go down and and we'll we'll see if it works. Uh, you mentioned the cap and and they're, they're they're definitely one of the teams that are are cap crunched and I know on the Vancast I think Farhan talked about how they're probably not going to buy out OEL um what players do you think they might be able to explore or might get traded in in the off season or any buyouts that you might think the Canucks might try to do or explore and who might be the most likeliest person bought out or, or traded. Yeah, there are a few players that I'm keeping close eye on. Tyler Myers is uh, is number one, right? Because for as much as um, we can point to all of Rickman Larson, if they're not going to buy him out, he's immovable. He's got a no move clause. Nobody's going to want that contract anyway. You could forget about that. So the other sort of source you look at is okay, Tyler Myers, but especially because of his six million dollar cap hit through next season, lack of terms. There's only the one year left, so you might be thinking, okay, maybe there's a way to to do this if we attach a modest sweetener, especially uh, once his um, bonus is paid out, where he's only owed one million dollars in actual cash, which is attractive for uh, a team to take on. At least not as daunting as if he was both a six million dollar cap hit and a six million dollar salary. The challenge is his, his signing bonus is uh, is due September fifteenth, which by that point a lot of business in the NHL has already been done. Hmm. So does that complicate things? He still has some level of trade protection and being able to, to pick teams that uh, he doesn't, you know, he, he, he can either have a five or 10 team, no trade list to sort of pick destination. So if you're his agent, do you go essentially, well, contenders probably not going to trade for me. I'm just going to put Arizona and yeah. Anaheim and all these other teams on my list. But then on the other hand, you know, could could management just go All right? Well, if you don't do this, we're going to bury you in the AHL. Mm-hmm. And, if, and so, if you want to play for your next contract, keep those keep those teams on the list because you're not going to have an NHL spot on this roster, right? So it's like it's going to be interesting to see how that dynamic plays out because that's an important six million. From there, I think we know that the Canucks have too much money invested on the wings, whether it's Brock Besser, Connor Garland, Anthony Bavillier. Those are the types of names where. They're going to have to be aggressive to try and shed some of uh, some of that salary, especially because you have a player like Nils Hoaglander, who is, is cooking in the American League and can provide NHL value for for you next season. Unless, of course, you want to use him as a sweetener to get off of another contract. So it's it's moving money off the books, like those some of those names, uh, and then uh, and then Myers. Those are a few of the names that. Um, that that stick out most prominently in in the search of trying to carve out cap flexibility with with guys like Besser and Garland you mentioned they've been much better since Tockett took charge do you think it's smart for the Canucks to to trade players that might be getting better under a new head coach yeah i think they i, I think they just need to <laughs> right they they have more they have, they have more pressing needs it's just yeah. the fact of the matter and when you look at Besser he's still a tad overpaid at at uh just over six, uh, six and a half, because for as much as his pre- playmaking has improved, he uh, he hasn't been scoring enough. And, and ultimately, his primary value needs to be as a goal scorer. His defensive game also continues to be a work in progress, which we thought had turned a corner under uh, under Travis Green towards, um you know, between sort of 2019 to 2021. That's regressed. So, he you know, he's still, you know, 
probably paid a bit too much. And, and Connor Garland, he's a good player. I, I like him, especially as five and five driver, but just too much money on the wings, especially with the emergence of uh, of Kuzmenko. You have pressing needs on the back end and at center ice where you because you have unmovable contracts like the OEL one, if you're going to create uh, flexibility some way, it has to be through uh, through those routes. So, uh, in fact, you have to try and take advantage of uh, even Anthony Bovillier, who's fit well here. If if he's if he's a if he's a player that draws interest, I I say you look to move him because that's um, that's one of the only sources you may have to to create that flexibility. I, I one second want... here, my, my my computer's just a two percent. Let me get my charger. Yeah. Okay, one second. Um, the Canucks, uh, obviously, as you know, and most Canucks fans know, they've traded a lot of their picks in the past couple of years and, and probably don't have the strongest uh, prospect system. But I know you've been doing a rankings uh, features at The Athletic about their top 10 prospects. In your mind, which prospect will have the most impact on the NHL team next season? Uh, maybe other than their 2023 pick that if it's uh, Connor Bedard, probably will have an impact on the Canucks next year. Yeah, it's interesting because when you look at some of their top prospects, whether it's uh, Jonathan Lekarimaki, Elias Pettersson over in Sweden, the defenseman, Danila Klimovic, I think those names are probably long-term projects. Arthur Silov sticks out as a as a player who I thought would have been a longer-term project, but he came up at um, for a stretch here when, uh, when Demko was still hurt and uh, when Martin was sent down, and he was brilliant. <laughs> he looked great far beyond where I expected him to be. He rocked a 907 or 908 save wow. percentage, which was really solid considering the defensive um, environment in front of him still wasn't that stable. It was still a, a work in progress at that point. So especially with the backup position being uncertain for next season, I'm curious to see how they balance the fact that he's probably the second best goaltender in, in the organization right now, but he also hasn't played a lot of games because of the COVID shutdown. Um, and I'm talking years past, not this season yeah. where he hasn't had a lot of professional action. So for goaltenders, they typically require a lot of game actions. And as, as a backup, you might only play 20 games. So maybe it's a situation where you take a creative approach and because Abbott's for the AHL affiliate is so close Maybe you can be creative in terms of um, you know re recalling him for a home stand and then demoting uh, demoting him back, back down and, and, and creating a situation where he's playing at both the AHL and NHL levels next season. So he's a player that um, could be vital for next season. And then Aturatu, I'm going to be curious to see whether he can challenge for roster spot ne next season. He's had some NHL games under his belt. I think he with his skating, it looks like he, um, he still needs, um, needs a little bit of time. So maybe it's a, maybe it's a case where he's more the type of player who comes up when, you know, there are perhaps injuries and that you maybe look at him as being a more impactful contributor, not next season, but the year after, but he's a sort of another name that comes to mind in, in terms of somebody who could have an immediate impact. Beyond that, I mean, there are there are other prospects like when you look at Linus Carlson or, or Archie Baines, where you go, okay, maybe these guys you know have some potential to be part of the equation for next season, uh, but they aren't as uh, as high end. And when I look at somebody like Jack Rathbone, I think for him that ship has probably sailed in terms of being a, a meaningful contributor for next season. Uh, bef before I let you go, I I kind of I want to ask what most Canucks fans want to know is what should the expectations be for the Canucks next year? Is it playoffs? Is it just be a better team? Um, presuming they don't win uh, the lottery and get Connor Bedard. Cause I think for any, whoever wins that is uh, definitely going in different places than if not. Yeah. Well, I think the expectation has to be for them to be competitive and, and make the playoffs based off of, how aggressively they um they bought at the deadline to acquire Philip Hronik. Uh, mm -hmm. Hronik is a, I think he's an excellent player, especially on the right right side. You've seen the immediate impact he's been able to make, but that's the sort of piece you acquire when when you're when you believe your window is now, and because of that, I think I think they have to sort of be be in that position. It would have been totally different if they hadn't made that Hronik trade, right? If they 
had continued sort of just, you know, drafted, drafted with that second Isles pick and, and, and kept their own second rounder as well. Then you would have looked at, okay, they're more restocking towards the future. This is more of a longer term view Then next season. I, I don't think there would have been a whole lot of expectations in terms of their competitiveness for the playoffs. But when you go out and you make a bold, bold, um, bold swing like that, and I'm not saying it's necessarily positive or negative, but when you take that type of risk, you have to back it up with uh, with short term results. In, in Heronic, uh, just quickly, do you think he's that good of a defenseman that he really expedites how poorly this team's been defensively for years and make them maybe more league average or or even better than that? Yeah, I mean, he's been a really, really steady two-way presence. I mean, he's a legit high-end top four defenseman, and that's why the price itself I actually had no problem with, right? Giving up a first and a second round pick for 25-year-old right shot defenseman who can st- – who can contribute in all facets like that. It's fair market price. Even if it's rich, it, it it's all just the conversation has been about timing. And I think with Horonic, it's interesting because I think he will have a significant impact on the blue line. It's just how much can one guy alone do? Yeah. Right. And, and that's where they still need to make upgrades in other areas. Even uh, when it comes to the penalty kill, right? The penalty kill has been right at the bottom of the league for two straight seasons. Under three different head, co- uh, three three different head coaches. Although the PK has been really good under talk, it's really it's been under two head coaches that it's really struggled. That has to take a significant step forward. And and how much of a difference can one player make for the PK? Maybe it's a lot. We'll see. I still don't. I still don't know. And going into next season, for me, they still need to look to add at least one more bona fide top four defenseman before I, I, I feel confident about this club's defensive form. But look. A big part of it is also how much can Thatcher Demko paper over? Because if he's playing an elite level, that can that can make up for a lot of uh, deficiencies. So we'll we'll see how that dynamic plays out uh, as well. Well, I, I hope the Canucks have a better year next year and, and maybe less tumultuous uh, than uh, this year. Uh, just before I let you go, any pieces going forward that you want to kind of share for the listeners or that they should keep their eyes and ears open for? for- from you at the athletic. Yeah. A couple of exciting ones. I think pretty soon here, I'm going to be dropping in uh, a feature on Elias Patterson where I've uh, spoken to over the last two or three years, a number of, uh, of high profile Swedish players around the league uh, and essentially just doing interviews, getting them to sort of break down Patterson's game, what they see, see about, see about him. That makes him special. Some of these guys have even played with him past world junior championships or, uh, at uh, at Worlds, so they have a bit of a unique uh, perspective and and have been able to see him at a, at a really close level. So, you know, names like Mika Zbinejad, um obviously Jacob Markstrom uh, was a teammate here here as well. Uh, William Nylander, like I, I'm excited in terms of some of the players that I was able to talk to, and um, even just today I wrapped up an interview with Marcus Nasland, and he's mm-hmm. so obviously a former great uh, Canuck, great Swede. So. I'm excited to put that together. And then um, another sort of um, feature, which I don't know exactly will drop. Maybe maybe it'll be next week as well. But a story on the double-edged sword of JT Miller's hyper-competitiveness hmm. in terms of it's been both such a driving force in his career, but it's also been the it's also been the cause of some of the deficiencies um in in terms of the bad body language and some of um you know the the ugly plays we saw early in the season which he himself has admitted to like this is not like a media driven thing he himself admits and and says that hey this com- this competitive nature in me it's more good than bad but those warts do do sort of stem from that so i i i'm uh, I, you know, I was, I was really excited with the interview I was able to do with, with him. He was super honest and frank as always. And, um, I'm uh, looking forward to talking to other people who, who know him well and, and being able to sort of tell that story about both the pros and cons of his hyper competitive sort of nature. And, and so people can have a glimpse and understanding of, w- of, of how he's wired, what his personality is like, what his character is like. Uh, and ultimately how that impacts not only his individual performance, but uh, the team as a whole. Well, I'm, I'm super excited to, to read both of those pieces for The Athletic. And uh, thanks so much for, for taking the time and coming on, Harmon. Of course. Thanks so much for having me, Alex.